You know, when you get the grade, when you get yourself, I guess you should say, when and if we can get ourselves out of the way, the grace of God is an overwhelming concept. I personally came to know the Lord Jesus Christ at about, I think I was eight or nine years old. I had parents who took me to church, exposed me to the preaching of the word. I made a decision at a revival meeting at a very, very young age. I don't know why God extended his grace to me. If we knew why, it wouldn't be grace, would it? See, there is, no, there is no reason when it comes to who we are and what we are. That's what makes it grace. Unfortunately, I did not understand that having a Savior also meant that I had a Lord. I had a lot of plans and ideas things I wanted to do, basically the life I wanted to live. It took me till my college years to come to a point in time when I said, Lord, the only thing I'm capable of is making a mess out of my life, so why don't you take over? And he did. Oh, I've not been perfect by any stretch, but Things drastically changed from that time. That decision came about in large part due to a group of Christians on that secular college campus. A couple of whom lived in our eight-person suite. And there were what were called in those days... Jesus freaks. I had long hair. But they loved the Lord. They played guitars and one of them drove a car. They called everywhere on campus the Jesus car because it had Jesus bumper stickers on it. And I don't mean just on the bumper. I mean every square inch. They read their Bibles faithfully, and I'd, I'd just never done that. They openly and unashamedly praised God. But they were not very well taught in the Scriptures. I came from a very different background, I suppose. I never did join in and wear long hair. I, well, I did have longer sideburns in those days. That was the style. I didn't quite fit with the Jesus freaks by outward appearance. I wore leather boots and jean jackets, and they called me the hillbilly. But I knew these folks were real in their heart. I suggested to those that I knew well, well, why don't you go to church on Sunday? And they, none of them went to church. That was strange to me. And, I, and I, when I could, I went to a, a church in town that was a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching, Bible-preaching church. And I was learning things that I never learned growing up in the church I grew up in. So I approached some of my friends and I said, you know, you really ought to go over here and attend this church on Sunday. Now, they, they, were, they were basically saved out of the hippie movement, if you know what I'm saying. So they were, they were against everything that was organized. 
But one of them said, you know what? Said a group of us went to that church one time. I said, you did? I said, well, did you have a good experience? He said, no. I said, what happened? He said, well, we drove up the park, we got out. We went in, and before we could even get into the auditorium, someone caught us in the hallway and said, you boys need to go get your hair cut. I actually agreed with that sentiment. I think they needed a haircut, but... But that's no reason to keep somebody out of church. And I don't care who walks up the steps and walks in the doors of a church. They belong here. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what they smell like. And believe me, I've seen it every which way. I don't care whether they have a lot or they have nothing. God's grace sufficient for everybody. Well, I went on to get married summer after my senior year. And Diane and I went on to seminary. Now that was culture shock. I mean culture shock. Coming off of a secular college campus, the conservative, conservative, I should say fundamental school to go to seminary. I mean, it was a 180 degree atmospheric change. Rules, rules, rules. Your hair had to be so long. Your wife could not wear slacks and uh, you know, you had to go to church on Sunday, and they, they took, kept track of everything. Took note of whether you went to church and even asked you how many people you'd witnessed to in the last week. I mean, you really had to toe the line here. I, fortunately, I was married and lived off campus, so I probably wouldn't even have made it. Probably got booted out for something. They had a little rule book. They called it a, a handbook, and... You carried it around and told you what, you know, what doors you could go in and what doors you could come out and what sidewalks you could walk on and, and, and what you could say. And it, it, it was, it was overwhelming. I couldn't remember all the rules. So after a couple of weeks, I said, this is ridiculous. And I threw away the rule book. I said, if I can't just be here because I'm a Christian and because I want to be a Christian and act like a Christian, then I don't belong here. I threw away the rule book, and I just did what I thought was I should do. They never had a problem. Met a lot of good people. And they weren't all. They weren't all the strict legalists that some of them were. Met a lot of people there that looked a whole lot different than the Jesus freaks, but they loved God too. And I got a great education. True internal spirituality. <laughs> Boy, that's another level. You see, when you throw away the rule book, when you get rid of your list of do's and don'ts, it doesn't get easier, it gets harder. Now, there's a freedom involved. And there's a joy that comes from that. But when you allow the Holy Spirit of God to be your guide, you literally are answering to God every moment of every day. With every thought, every action, every attitude. That's what the Bible means when it says we ought to be filled with the Spirit. Present tense. All the time. Completely. Submitted to the will of God and the Lordship of Christ. You see, rules can be overwhelming, I suppose, in certain settings, but ultimately they're never long enough. And they, are, they always only affect the outward. True spirituality produced by the Holy Spirit, produced by God inside a person, internally. Internally. 
That's a challenge of a lifetime. But it's real spirituality. It's not man-made. It's God-produced. Now, last week, we looked at verses 19, I believe it was, verses 18, 19 in particular. And we talked about how we should not let anybody else rob us of the confidence we have in Jesus Christ. But you see, legalism does that. Legalism says Jesus isn't enough. God isn't enough in you and through you. You need a little external help. So, Paul says, don't don't let anyone... Don't let anyone judge you, verse 16. And then in verse 19, or verse 18, he says, Don't let anyone cheat you out of your reward or literally disqualify you from serving God with joy and, and earning the rewards he has laid up for you. No, don't let someone take that away from you. Don't knuckle under to that. Don't allow that to be your guide. But now in verse 20, and this is where we start this morning. In verse 20, he asks this question, and the question is, Why? Why did he just say those things to us? What is it about legalism that is so destructive, that is so artificial? Verse 20, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Why? Well, there's five reasons why that he outlines in verses 20 to 23. Five reasons why legalism does not produce real spirituality. Five reasons why it falls short. Five five reasons why it's a substitute for the real thing. I don't want any of us, I don't want any of you to ever ever lose the joy of living with Jesus Christ in your, in your life, to, to, to experience Him from the inside out, to know and walk with Him and yield to Him and see Him change you and make you into what you ought to be. Turn your back on those things that do not do that. First of all, I want you to notice with me that legalism is simplistic in nature. It's simplistic. It's not comprehensive. It doesn't have the answer for much of anything. He says, therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, the basic principles of the world, you see it back in verse 8 in the same chapter, where he says, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world. What are those basic principles? It's the things that people begin with when they come to learn to know anything about God and what's right and wrong. And we would have to classify the Old Testament law. Those were basic principles. The word in the Greek translated basic principles is a word which means letters put one behind the other. It's basically saying the ABCs. When you go to kindergarten, you learn your letters first. A, B, C, D, E, and so on. And then you learn to form words, and then you learn to form sentences, and and then you learn about grammar and making paragraphs and reading and all that. But the basic principles is where you start. And the law and all that goes with that Old Testament system was where God started His people. But He never wanted them to stay there. The law was designed to show man that he was a sinner. To show man that he needed something else. That he needed a Savior. To show man that he was corrupt and incapable depraved and and unable to do anything toward his own salvation, but needed a Savior who would give him the pure grace that was required. Anything that reaches back 
and tries to hold on to Old Testament law as a part of our experience as Christians today is dredging up the first principles as if they were not learned. I guess they hadn't been if that's what you're doing. Dwelling on the simplistic of truth versus the meat of Christian theology. Now he says two things in verse 20 in this regard and around this. He says, if you die. Now the if here is the first class in the Greek, which means it's assumed to be true when he says it. He's saying to the Colossians, you have died. You have died with Christ. From the basic principles of the world. Why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves then to regulations? So he's speaking to us as believers here, and he's saying to us, we have died with Christ. Now, you might want to take out your pen or pencil and find some space on your bulletin or your notepad here and write these things down. Because it gets a little bit hard to put this all together. I want to try to simplify it quickly. First of all, an unbeliever is dead spiritually, Ephesians 2, 1. We were dead spiritually, Ephesians 2, 1. That means we did not possess the Spirit of God. We were separated from God. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, Paul says in Ephesians 2, 1. Number two, we still existed. We were spiritually dead, but we were still physically alive. We were governed by the flesh. We were governed by our own fleshly desires. We were dead spiritually, but we were alive physically still. And consumed by and ruled by the flesh. But when we received Christ as Savior, that old man that we were, that, 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 that shallow man, that, that, man which was empty on the inside, that man who was simply flesh. And I'm just not talking about, you know, flesh and bone, but the natural man without God. He died when God revived the spiritual part and gave us the Spirit of God at the moment we accepted Jesus Christ. So when we were made alive spiritually by the entrance of the Holy Spirit into our life. The old man, as we were, is gone. We don't exist in that same capacity. We still have the flesh to deal with because we didn't die physically, but we're not like we were. We're no longer an empty shell governed by the flesh but we are an empty shell that has now become full of the indwelling Holy Spirit who takes over. And so we become a new person. Now, let's back up in our context just a, a little bit. Look back at verse 11. In Him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. He's talking about the new birth. He's using Old Testament phraseology and symbolism to tell us that's what he's talking about. A circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Talking about that time we received Christ. And then he says we were buried, in verse 12, buried with him in baptism. Now that means when the Spirit of God did come in, at the moment of our salvation, we were placed not only he not only was placed into us, but we were literally, by his work, placed into a body of believers. That's talking about spirit baptism. So, the old man literally was dead and buried. He doesn't exist in that form anymore. He is a spiritual man. And so something has changed. Now, if you drop down to verse 20, it talks about, if you died, since you died, your old man's gone. You're a new creature in Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Now jot down here another reference here that you want to look up, and that's Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Galatians 
I have been crucified, says Paul. I have been crucified with Christ. He's talking about the same thing. Died with Christ. Buried with Christ. Crucified with Christ. He's talking about the old man being done away with as he existed. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm a new creature. The Spirit of God has made the difference. Now again, let's go back to our text. Colossians 2.20 Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, what did the basic principles of the world tell you? Told, told you you were an empty shell of a human being, depraved and without hope? A sinner that could not be... Uh, Saved by your own effort. But we've been, re- we've been removed from that. So we, not only, the old man is not only dead, but we're literally dead to the, the law that showed the old man he was dead. Therefore, if you died with Christ, he says, from the basic principles of the world, why? As though living in the world. Living, that's what we, that's what we have now, life. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, who served a believer that Him should not perish, but how have, not might have, could have, would have, someday, no, already has, life, eternal life, provided by the Spirit. So, given our new life, and given our past life, which is now over and done with, we have no reason to go back to the principles that operated in terms of the old man's needs. Simply to show him that he was a sinner. Now if you look at verse 14, we can back up a little bit again. What does it say about those first principles, the Old Testament law? Speaking of Christ, who forgave us, at the end of verse 13, he goes on in verse 14 saying that this is what he did, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. Yeah, that's what the law was, contrary to us. It told us we were sinners, never helped us become anything, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. The indebtedness that we had because of our sin was done away with when it was literally atoned for by the death of Christ on Calvary's cross. And so the dead of sin and the one who wipes away that sin is brought together and the cross is God's signature on our debt that says paid in full. So why in the world would we want to get out our claw hammer and find the old rugged cross somewhere and get down on our hands and knees and try to pry the nails out of the ordinances that would have been nailed to the cross when Christ was put there? Makes no sense whatsoever. We don't need the simplistics. Legalism is always simplistic. But then number two, second reason. Legalism is negative in orientation. Let's go back to our text. After saying, do not subject yourselves, or why do you subject yourselves, to regulations at the end of verse 20, He then gives us an idea of what those regulations are that he's talking about. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. You notice they're all negative. (coughs) Basic principles primarily have to do with prohibitions. He said, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Now, none of us would argue that we're free from all prohibitions. We're not. Because there's right and wrong. And the Spirit of God is going to direct us toward the right and away from the wrong. But what, what he is saying here is this. Those principles 
Those basic principles, those things that some want to hang on to, and he talked about them as we saw last week, the Sabbaths, the new moons, and the festivals, and, and the dietary laws, and all that. Those who want to hold on to those things, those basic principles, are holding on to a bunch of thou shalt nots. But there's nothing there that produces anything spiritual. Basic principles revolve around prohibitions. There is always little, if any, emphasis on the positive aspects of spirituality in any legalistic system. A man by the name of Steve Smith writes on a website entitled libertyforcaptives.com. <clears throat> I want to just read you a brief excerpt, something he says in one of his articles. He says, we can choose to define ourselves, our families, and our churches by what we don't do. Churches or families who function this way spend more and more time focusing on rules and regulations, external behavior, and living in fear and shame. They spend a lot of time judging other people, or else they get mired in a morbid self-introspection. They view, their view of God is of mean, a mean-spirited, cosmic killjoy just waiting to pounce and punish. Or, he says, we can choose to define ourselves by what grace looks like in our lives. Grace, that marvelous, transformative, saving reality which is given as a free gift through Jesus Christ. People who walk in grace are full of joy, charity, and confidence. They view God, their view of God is of a merciful, involved, compassionate Redeemer who already took the penalty for their sins, past, present, and future. That's a stark contrast. Think about it. Thou shalt not handle, thou shalt not touch, thou shalt not taste. Does not produce joy, love. Does not produce long-suffering or peace or kindness or goodness or faithfulness. It does not produce self-control. doesn't produce any of those internal qualities that are all listed as the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22. We all are going to be tempted to become negative in our Christian experience one time or another and probably multiple times. You can choose to look at those people around you in terms of their faults or in terms of what God can do through his grace in their lives. And if you don't develop the right perspective and maintain it, your Christian experience is going to be a miserable, miserable experience. We need to see people for the potential they have in, in and of and with and because of the grace of God. But let's move on. A third reason why legalism does not produce spirituality. Legalism is external in focus, and we've already all made, already made this point, but let's just uh, follow it through here in verse 22. Speaking of those prohibitions he mentions in verse 21, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. He says this, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. He's talking about, again, going back to those dietary laws we mentioned last week and the do not taste, touch, handle, taste this week. He's going back to those basic principles, the dietary restrictions of the Old Testament law and so on. And he's saying they're, they're just external. They, they only affect the outward appearance, you see. Now, Jesus said something very important here. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. Mark, chapter 7, verses 14 to 23. You ought to jot it down and read it later. I'll give you the gist of it. 
the Pharisees, the legalists of their day, said, you've got to be careful what you eat. Yeah, you don't want to get any of that unclean stuff. You, you know, you'll be defiled. Now, God gave those stipulations, those, those rudimentary principles, those ABCs long ago to show them that God wanted them to be righteous and not defiled. It was a teaching mechanism in the law. But Jesus went far beyond that. Verse 14, hear me everyone and understand, there is nothing that enters a man that from outside which can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. <laughs> he defines that a little later. In verse 21, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, evil eyes, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, and on and on and on. Because that's what's in the heart. It's an internal change that's needed, not an external acquiescence to someone's idea. Now, not only should we avoid those groups that reach back into the past and try to hold on to the ABCs, the rudimentary basic principles, but we also have people that like to take those things and, you know, just have, and, you know, just add a little bit more to it as we go. That's what the Pharisees did. They went way beyond what the law said. And they, they called it their interpretation of the law, but what it was really was just adding more, just adding more. And the church has not been immune to this. <coughs> there is, has been in church history. What's called, uh, <clears throat> asceticism, which means efforts that men made to separate themselves from the world. <clears throat> to make themselves completely distinct from unbelievers. Probably one of the most famous one was one man by the name of Simon Stylites who spent 36 years sitting on a 50-foot pole. Now, that just sounds absolutely ludicrous to us today. Why would someone waste 36 years of their life sitting on Because he had the idea that he would be more spiritual if he could somehow afflict his flesh. That somehow, if you can afflict that flesh that carried over into the new birth, that the Spirit will take over and you will be everything you should be. Now, it doesn't mean we should not pay mind to our flesh and the choices we make and so on, but that's not accomplished by sitting on a pole for 36 years. It's not accomplished by living in a, in a cave like a lot of the monks did and wearing, wearing uh, garments made out of uh, animal fur that was abrasive to the skin. And, and the things that they did back in... Uh, 400s and the 500s, all those pictures you see of the monks and so forth. It seems silly to us today. But it's just changed form. It's still around, one way or another, in the form of legalism. I could, and I, and I won't use names, but I could tell you of a man who was well known quite a number of years ago in Christian circles, did a lot of seminars, teaching who advocated that it was really spiritual not to marry, to remain celibate. Well, in the end, his own staff and own family fell prey to temptation. See, it, it crops up in subtle ways, different times. It's always there. But let's move on quickly to number four. Not only is it simplistic, negative, and external, reason number four, it is deceptive in practice. It is deceptive in practice. Let's look at verse 23. 
Now speaking about the external things he just talked about, he says, these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom. In self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body. An appearance of wisdom. Not wisdom, just an appearance of wisdom. And the source here is from men. They're man-made. The outward appearance is of humility, but it's false of humility. The outward experience is of real worship, but it's not. The word religion here means worship in the Greek. It's fake worship and false humility. This is couched in the thou shalt not, don't test don't taste, and so on. The commandments of the men then become the appearance of wisdom. And in a legalistic system, the only thing that really matters is the appearance. I could give you a long list of people. I could tell you some people that taught in the schools that I went to that have fallen prey to temptation and ruined their ministries and ruined their lives because they were focused on the outward appearance and they forgot the importance of the internal. Day by day, spirit-controlled life. Laws do not make people better. It may appear that way because they're controlled. Nothing about it affects change on the inside. By the way, a little commentary. Maybe call it my opinion, so I will footnote it. But I'll ask this question. Why do so many of our young people from Christian churches where the Word of God is preached fall away from the faith when they go off to school? There's a lot of there's a, there's a lot of opinions about that. So I might as well add mine to the to the group, right? <laughs> I think it's because parents too often are concerned about controlling their children rather than really dealing with the internal matters of their heart. If I can just control my children, if I can just make give them a right set of rules, if I can just be the disciplinarian I should be, and everything will be fine, and they forget to deal with them about truth, to spend time with them in the Scriptures, talk to them about the things that matter deeply and the things that come from the inside out, attitudes more than behaviors. And as soon as they go into an environment where there's no external control, they're lost. Because there's no, been no internal regulation. He talks here about the, the false humility and the self-imposed worship. The man-made, self-styled aspect of this deceptiveness. Here's another quote from Steve Smith and the same one I quoted earlier. From a different article. He says, the average legalist does not know that he or she is a legalist. I didn't. In other words, the writers say he once was a legalist. He says, the average legalist does not know that he or she is a legalist. I didn't. I thought I was just following God's word. I didn't think I was a Pharisee. I thought I was righteous. He goes on, legalism is rightly considered a disease in the church but most of its sufferers mistake its symptoms for holiness. They think they have the mind of Christ and that everyone else is carnal. So if you ever get to that point, you need to take some real stock in where you're at spiritually. If you think you can serve as the judge and the critic of everybody else's life, 
Not a good position to be in. Legalism is deceptive. And then finally, number five. Legalism is worthless against the flesh. You remember that flesh we talked about? That, that, that shell of a man without the Spirit of God, dead spiritually, he's saved, but the Spirit of God comes into his heart and soul and that flesh is retained. And it obviously will be dealt with and done away with when the Lord comes back and we're resurrected. But until then, we got to deal with it. And a lot of legalism is, has nothing to do with salvation in people's minds. Yeah, there are those legalists that you got to do this, do this, and do this to get saved on top of believing on Jesus, and that's what was going on in, in Colossae. But there's more legalism in the church <coughs> that is not focused on salvation so much as it's focused on sanctification. Okay, we're saved, we're saved by grace. I accept that, I acknowledge that. But, to be holy, you've got to do this, do this, do this, or, or don't do this, or don't do this, or don't do this. And they get their little list, and it's always way too small. It's always externally visible. And internal change is overlooked. Legalism has no effect in overcoming the sinful desires of the flesh. Now, let me just illustrate that very easily. Speed limits. Do speed limits make better drivers? Only when the cop's around, maybe. But when the cop's not there, you don't do a doggone thing for people's speed. They just buzz right by them. You go ahead and put up your speed limit, 65 miles an hour, and watch the trucks go by at 80. Choo, 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 choo. It's not the law that changes behavior. The law only points out bad behavior. I know there's a few of us around that really do obey the speed limits. A few of us. And the rest of us only have to aspire to that. Okay. I don't purposely violate speed limits. I just do so absent-mindedly. That's my excuse anyway. Legalism is worthless in regard to changing behavior, in regard to overcoming flesh. You'll hear people say, well, you know, you've got to be separated from the world. You've got you to remain separate from the world. I agree 100%. You sure do. But we need to understand what the world is and where the world is. So how about if we look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. John tells us exactly where the world's at and what the world does. 1 John 2.15 Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world. And here he gives us what's in the world. The lust of the flesh. Where's that at? Inside us. The lust of the flesh. And the pride of life, where's that? Is that out there in the world somewhere? No, that's, that's inside of us too. Hmm. For all is in the world, the, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, the desire to possess things that are not ours. Is that outside of us? Well, the temptation may be, but the desire comes from inside. The world we got to be separated from is inside of us. It's not out there. It's not change your appearance because you don't want to look like the world. I've heard that one before. It's not, I don't, don't do this and don't do that because that's what the world does. I've heard that one before. And some of that may be things that are good to follow. But it doesn't mean 
you have then become holy somehow and sanctified because you're now separated from the world. No, the world he's talking about is the what indwells our flesh that we have to battle against all the time. And law, legalism, is absolutely worthless in that battle. It's like putting up a 70 mile per hour speed limit on the interstate. Well, let's conclude everything. I, I have preached for three or four weeks on legalism. I could have breezed by it in a week or maybe two, but the Lord just wouldn't let me do that. It was too much here to literally analyze. I think we've mostly looked at it from the, from the standpoint of don't, don't allow ourselves to be influenced by legalism, but there's, a, there's another temptation here, and I think we've, we've come to it today in particular, and that is don't be legalistic. Don't be that way. It all... I think may boil down to how we look at God because how we look at God is the God we try to emulate in our own life. Do you see God as a policeman? Or do you see God as a fireman? Do we perceive that God's all about just policing us in the world? Or is God really intent on saving a world that's already lost beyond repair? I think it's the latter. God is a fireman and he needs firemen to hop on the back of the truck. He needs volunteer firemen. He doesn't need any more policemen. <clears throat> 